Thank you, Ishtwan. Greetings, everyone. I would like to begin my presentation by um, publicly expressing my gratitude and the happiness to be invited to present my research at the University of Exeter, Maxlis. My name is Dunja Rašić, and I am an aspiring specialist in philosophical Sufism and the school of Ibn Arabi. My uh, first work or first published monograph on the topic focuses on the science of the letters and the art of Ibn Arabi. This book began as a playful experiment. Uh, I wanted to demonstrate uh, that Ibn Arabi's writings uh, on cosmology and uh, the act of Genesis or rather Ibn Arabi's teaching in general can be summarized uh, by focusing only on what he wrote on properties and symbolism of the letters of the Arabic alphabet. My second book uh, in the field is set to be presented to the editorial board of the State University of New York Press on Friday. It focuses on Jean Doppelgangers and the problem of evil in Akbarian Sufism, and if all goes well, it will hopefully be published later this year. The research I'm going to present to you today is based on a paper that I recently submitted to the special edition of Religious Journal, uh, which was edited by Pablo Benito. As the title indicates, it focuses on the music of the spheres in Akbarian Sufism. Uh, now, Mukhchidin, Ibn Arabi, unlike myself, uh, barely needs an introduction to the audience. He is widely known today as a Sufi sage uh, poet and um, greatest of all Muslim philosophers, according to some. Uh, the teachings I'm going to present today uh, were mostly preserved in Ibn Arabi's magnum opus, The Meccan Revelations. Ibn Arabi uh, began working on this book um, in the early 13th century Anno Domini. But before we dwell into details in Ibn Arabi's works, there is a short video I would like to show you. Uh, the recording was made on June 24th, 2016, when the spacecraft Juno entered or crossed the border of Jupiter's enormous magnetic field. On that day, the following sound was recorded. It is the so-called uh, roar of Jupiter. Throughout the centuries, numerous scholars claimed to have heard this sound or the sound of planets orbiting in their celestial spheres. This sound was um, greatly praised uh, for its nobility and beauty. As a, and as a result, uh, it eventually got to be known as the music of the spheres. The earliest surviving written records about the music of the spheres are dated around 6th century BC. It was also around this time that Pythagoras of Samos was um, walking past a blacksmith's door. The sound of hammering uh, soon caught Pythagoras' attention, uh, with the blacksmith explaining to him how the weight and size of a hammer impacts the sound uh, it makes. According to legend, this encounter uh, presumably inspired Pythagoras to develop his theory on the music of the spheres. Other stories, uh, however, claim that Pythagoras actually developed his theory uh, with the help of uh, Babylonian magi. Prior to the 6th century BC, the planet Earth was envisioned in Greek cosmology as a flat disk surrounded by the river Oceanus. Babylonians, however, believe there are seven heavens surrounding the earth. These seven heavens were sometimes identified with uh, planets orbiting on their celestial spheres, like um, figuratively speaking, on solid tracks or rails. Centuries later, uh, even Arabi compared these planetary spheres to layers of an onion 
where art uh, would recommend, uh, represent the center of this cosmic onion. Alternatively, Ibn Arabi compared uh, the planetary spheres and the uh, earth. Oh, he described these spheres as domes above the earth or cellings. In 16th century AD, Ottoman court astronomers estimated that the sphere of Saturn, which is the largest planetary sphere in existence, is some um, 54 million 93,400 miles away from Earth. The sphere of Saturn is depicted in color black uh, on the diagram that you can see on the current slide. The planet Earth represents the center of this diagram. And the six smaller spheres uh, between sphere of Saturn and the planet Earth have been traditionally identified as the sphere of Jupiter, Sun, Mercury, Venus, uh, and of course, the sphere of uh, the moon. Pythagora surmised that all these spheres have different measurements and that spheres like hammers emit different sounds based on their specific measurements. This music of the spheres was thought to have impact on the life on earth and Pythagoras writings uh, about the music of the spheres as well as attempts to reproduce this music uh, with musical instruments in order to harness uh, its power gained prominence uh, in ancient Greece by the 4th century BC. They were likely introduced to the Arabic intellectual milieu around 9th century AD, possibly through Johanna ibn al-Batrik's translation of Pseudo Aristotle's Kitab al-Siyasa. Another strong contender which might have introduced these and similar uh, theories to Muslim cultures and societies is Pseudo-Aristotle's uh, Kitab Sir al-Srar. Both these works presumably had great impact on the philosophical works of Al-Kindi, which uh, later had them promoted further. It is therefore not surprising that echoes of these teachings uh, can also be found in Ibn Arabi's works. For instance, there is a surviving diagram in Ibn Arabi's own hand depicting the planet Earth surrounded by the heavenly spheres. As you can see from the current diagram, or maybe not since the letters are small, in any case, the names and arrangement of the planetary spheres in Akbarian cosmology also follow uh, Greek uh, cosmological models. Uh, Ibn Arabi, did not deny the existence of the music of the spheres. And he also claimed that this music um, has an impact on the life on earth, just like Pythagoras did before him. Now, even Arby claimed to have studied the works of Hellenistic philosophers, uh, and he found that some of their teachings are sound. This is especially the case with uh, cosmological theories of Isaac Israeli the Elder. That said, even Arabi denied uh, any direct influence of Hellenistic philosophy on his teachings. He claimed that all his works and theories are the direct products uh, of the divine revelations he received. Uh, when it comes to his writings on the music of the spheres in particular, uh, these were also based on certain spiritual practices we will examine later which uh, presumably enabled Ibn Arabi to hear this music uh, for himself. Uh, in my presentation today, I will focus on the aesthetical qualities and the nature of the music of the spheres as described in Ibn Arabi's magnum opus, uh, The Meccan Revelations. Uh, we will be examining how the building elements and the form of celestial spheres impact the sound they make. And in addition, as I said before, we will be aiming to pinpoint the method Ibn Arabi used to hear the music of the spheres for himself. This will serve as a foundation for further discussions on Ibn Arabi's notions of Sama'a 
and our attempts to determine the role of the music of the spheres uh, in uh, Akbarian Sufism. Now, when writing about the music of the spheres and the heavenly spheres in general, even I be claimed that these spheres um, belong to the higher celestial realms, as opposed to the planet Earth, which he identified with the visible world of uh, gross matter. Uh, all, all living beings and all forms of, of existence uh, on Earth uh, were thought to be made from the admixture of four elements. These are, of course, fire, water, air, and earth, the four elements which build uh, the visible world. These four elements were thought uh, to have an impact on the character and appearance of all living beings. I will give just one example to illustrate my point. Uh, all uh, living beings, uh, even are we claimed, are made from four elements. However, uh, the mixture of these elements uh, is what matters. And for instance, uh, Ibn Arbi held that the bodies of jinn uh, are predominantly made of fire and air. And because uh, jinn have more air in their bodies than humans, this gives them the shape-shifting abilities. In addition, uh, the element of fire has a great impact of the character of these creatures, making them arrogant, rash, and prone to anger also. They are um, uh, very um, quick uh, to get angry and uh, very slow to forgive and consumed with this desire to burn bright and outshine everyone in their surroundings. Having studied the properties of the four elements and the heavenly spheres, Ibn Arabi reached the conclusion that the spheres exhibit certain properties which cannot be um, attributed to either of these uh, four elements. And this led him to the conclusion there must be a fifth element uh, in existence. Ibn Arabi identified the this fifth element as the universal nature. There is a surrounding, uh, there is a surviving diagram in Ibn Arabi's own hand uh, depicting a universal nature. Uh, you can see it on the right side of the current slide. Now in truth, the diagram has uh, several elements, but the universal nature is the second form from the bottom. It's the rectangular form divided into four triangles. I will explain the reasoning behind this uh, form shortly. For um, in the Meccan revelations, Ibn Arabi identified the universal nature as an um, intelligible um, substance, which has four distinct qualities. In other words, the universal nature can be either hot, cold, dry, and or moist. And these four properties are depicted as the four triangles on the current slide. In the 11th chapter of the Meccan revelations, Ibn Arabi identified the universal nature as the fifth element the spheres are made of. However, in the ninth chapter of this same work, uh, he suggested that the spheres are actually uh, made of smoke instead. Either way, they transcend the visible world of gross matter. Even though we believed that the heavenly spheres were made just for the sake of humans. And as a result, uh, the perfect human was drawn at his diagram of the heavenly spheres to emphasize uh, on this point. Now I accidentally went uh, one slide again. Anyway, we are back where we wanted to be. As I said, he believed that these spheres were made just for the sake of humans and they were made to serve twofold purpose. On the one hand, the perfect shape was meant to remind humans of uh, God the creator. What they meant to say is that Ibn Arabi, like Aristotle, believed that circle is the most perfect form in existence and the circular form of the heavenly spheres was meant to reflect some 
of the divine perfection. The spheres were then adorned with uh, celestial bodies, such as planets and stars, so that human beings uh, could tell time. The music of the spheres is the direct product of the revolution of the celestial spheres, or so did Ibn Arabi believe. Centuries before Ibn Arabi, uh, Plato identified uh, this music as the singing of uh, the muses. Ibn Arabi did not agree with this in interpretation, not in the least since he did not believe in muses. What he did believe is that angels, like planets, also inhabit celestial spheres. However, the spheres are not angels and they do not consciously sing in praise of God. As a matter of fact, uh, even though Ibn Arab insisted that, that the world is alive in the entirety, he um, claimed that the heavenly spheres are completely unaware of uh, God's existence. And he had them compared to chairs in this regard. A heavenly sphere, like a chair, uh, has absolutely no knowledge of the craftsman who made it. And yet, merely by existing and singing, uh, the spheres uh, stand witness of the existence and perfection of God, the creator. Now, since the heavenly spheres were made for the sake of uh, human beings, it would not be too far-fetched to assume that their music was also intended for humans rather than God. However, in order to be able to harness uh, the power of this uh, music, in order to uh, be able to profit from this music, each human being must first learn how to hear it. God the Creator was described in the Quran as the all-hearing, all-knowing, and the all-hearing, all-seeing. And the order of words uh, in these verses uh, led Ibn Arabi to the conclusion that the auditory perception is more reliable than visual perception, and possibly even more reliable than rational analytical thinking. It is therefore not surprising that um, he advised his readers to rely more on their ears when uh, examining the properties of the music of the spheres. This is also the same approach uh, that Pythagoras adopted long ago, at least according to legend. In other words, through some unutterable, inconceivable likeness to gods, Pythagoras' hearing and his mind were intent upon the celestial harmonies of the cosmos. It seemed as if he alone could hear and understand the universal harmony and the music of the spheres, of the stars which move within them, uttering a song more complete and satisfying than any human melody, composed of subtly varied sounds of motions and speeds and sizes and positions. That quoted paragraph uh, actually comes from the works of Jan Blichus. However, uh, similar statements um, can also be found in the works of Sukhravarti and Mula Sadra Shirazi, with Sukhravarti claiming to have made the similar ascent through the heavenly spheres himself. Uh, such claims were really not unheard of in classical antiquity either. I will give just one example. Uh, for instance, a Simplicius of Kilikia claimed that each human, including himself, uh, could um, get to hear the music of the spheres if only they were to purify their senses. The heavenly realms and the heavenly spheres uh, were traditionally identified with uh, purity, divinity, and advanced spiritual knowledge in both Greek and Arabic culture. And Ibn Arabi himself uh, identified each of the heavenly spheres with specific knowledge. He claimed that no human in history could ever compare to Imam Madawi al Kulum uh, with regard to his knowledge of the spheres. Now, the Imam gained his knowledge directly 
by the means of the divine revelation without having to struggle to reach the heavenly spheres uh, first. In theory, each human being uh, could uh, receive a divine revelation provided that uh, their heart is pure and that both their heart and their mind are open towards God and uh, fully directed towards him focusing all their attention uh, on God alone. That said, even if a human being uh, were to meet all these preconditions, there are no guarantees, even are be claimed, that the divine revelations will appear. And as a matter of fact, he claimed that no spiritual seeker, no matter how advanced, can ever dictate the content of the divine revelations uh, they receive. So even if they were to receive a divine revelation, there's no guarantee that it would be concerned with uh, the music of the spheres, no matter how desperately they wish to hear it or understand um, this particular problem. Hence, uh, Ibn Arabi advised um, his readers who wish to compete with uh, Imam Madawil Plum in knowledge uh, to uh, focus uh, their attention on the mysteries of the prayer. <laughs> this is somewhat ironic for, as you can see on the current slide, uh, whereas Pythagoras uh, presumably uh, be had to become akin to gods in order to reach the heavenly spheres, uh, Ibn Arabi advised his students to pray to God instead. However, as Ibn Arabi said uh, in a poem, how many pray and have from their prayer nothing but a vision of the wall before them, of toil and trouble. But some are, however, graced with intimate conversations with God ever and ever. The ability uh, to hear the music of the spheres uh, is just one of the many benefits of a properly executed prayer uh, that were listed in Ibn Arabi's works. Now, in uh, his works, Ibn Arabi identified seven elements of each prayer. Uh, music of the spheres, or rather the ability to hear the music of the spheres, was associated with prostrations, or um, rather sujud el tilawa in particular. This Arabic term can be roughly translated as recitation from the Quran during or after prostrations. Uh, it was practiced uh, based on the assumption there are certain verses from the Quran uh, which would always make uh, the prophet Muhammad prostrate uh, to himself to the ground each time uh, he would get to hear one of them. Ibn Arabi recorded in chapter 69 of the Meccan revelations that um, his contemporaries were not in agreement on the number of these verses. On his side, however, uh, he um, listed the uh, fifth such verses in the Meccan revelations alongside certain indicators that can be used to show us whether uh, we were prostrating the way we should have. The 14th of these verses is of special importance to us. I am referring uh, in, in particular to the 21st verse of the Surah Al-Furqan, uh, which reads, those who do not expect to meet us say, oh, if only the angels were sent down to us, or if we could see our Lord. They have certainly been carried away by their arrogance and have entirely exceeded all limits. This verse and the prostration associated with it are important to us since one of the indicators that that uh, this prostration uh, was properly ex executed is actually uh, the ability to hear the music of the spheres. This is what Ibn Arabi wrote uh, in the Meccan revelations in particular. The 14th prostration is the prostration of totality and existence. If a person bows down in this prostration and does not gain the knowledge of the tones and melodies of the spheres, if that person 
does not get to see the sound of each of these tones as the melodies of the true in the universe. If they do not witness David, peace be upon him in this revelation, and if they do not see the sounds and letters articulating every wondrous meaning, jolting unshakable mountains with music and making the mother who lost her child laugh with delight and joy, then that person did not bow sincerely. In other words, each of us could get to hear the music of the spheres if an hour be claimed, if only we were to bow sincerely the way we should. That leaves us in, with the question, what are the actual benefits of these musics and what were its practical uses in Aquarian Sufism? On his side, Kramartz identified three distinct criteria for evaluating music. These are, of course, uh, art or aesthetics, morals, and the exterior purpose of music. Now, the music of the spheres was not deemed to be problematic based on either of these, uh, not in the Ibn Arabi's works, at least. It was certainly beautiful and elating for, as we have seen on the previous slide, it could uh, presumably make a mother who just lost her child uh, laugh and weep the tears of joy. Uh, it was certainly powerful because it could also make mountains crumble to dust. Music of the spheres and music in general were not deemed to be problematic from a moral point of view either. And to um, back his claims, Ibn Arabi actually quoted a hadith uh, which reads that the Prophet Muhammad allowed a woman to play on a tambourine for him. However, um, this is not to say that either music or the music of the spheres were uh, much va valued among advanced um, spiritual practitioners. The exterior purpose of the music of the spheres in Aquarian Sufism cannot be studied apart from Ibn Arabi's notions of sama. Sama was once famously described by Vitamaki as possibly the most controversial of all Sufism practices. Uh, this term can be roughly translated as the act of listening. However, um, it is chiefly used today uh, in religious and academic literature for Sufi gatherings where devotional music was sung and heard. This is uh, not to say, however, uh, that Ibn Arabi absolutely in all cases identified Sama with music. As a matter of fact, he differentiated between three types of sama in uh, his works. These are divine, spiritual, and natural sama. As you may have guessed, the divine sama was thought to be the most noble and most powerful of these three types of sama. It was chiefly associated with kun, or the creative word of God, and the Sufi attempts to harness the power of the creative word of God for themselves. Before I uh, define a uh, spiritual Sama, which was thought to be similar to divine Sama in that regard, uh, it is important to take into account that Ibn Arabi and his students and followers envisioned the universe and all in it as the words of God inscribed on the outstretched parchment of existence. Spiritual Sama uh, was de uh, defined as the ability to see the first intellect, to which Ibn Arabi sometimes referred to as the highest pen, inscribing the words of existence uh, on this parchment. Nat uh, natural Sama is the only one of the three types of Sama uh, that Ibn Arabi actually explicitly linked uh, to fine tunes, uh, music, and melodies. And it goes without saying that the music of the spheres actually uh, belongs to natural Sama. Ibn Arabi uh, on his side compared the sound of the music of the spheres to the sound of a water wheel. 
this is what he said in particular. When the sound descends on spiritual seekers, as they pass through the spheres, and on account of the movement of the spheres, there are good, pleasant melodies the hearing delights in, like the sound of a water wheel. Even Arabi, uh, in his works, linked Sufi attempts to harness the power of the music of the spheres to Kawali. This term Kawali is often used as the synonym for Sama'a or natural Sama'a in aquarium context. For instance, on the current slide, you can see Qureshi's twofold definition of Kawali. On the one hand, Qureshi defined the Kawali as gathering for the purpose of realizing ideas of Islamic mysticism through the ritual of listening to music of Sama. However, Kawali was uh, concurrently identified as music genre and or a group of songs performed at spiritual gatherings in Pakistan and India. William Chittick uh, previously suggested that even Arabi's music theories had great impact on uh, Sufi practices and music genres on the Indian subcontinent. It is, however, difficult to pinpoint the exact scope of influence of Ibn Arabi's writings on contemporary Kawali performances, since there are no uh, exhaustive descriptions and definitions of musical performances in any of the surviving works of Ibn Arabi, to the best of my knowledge, at least. In addition, um, the music practices Ibn Arabi uh, was referring to likely had more in common to music and poetical practices in the style of um, Ibn Bajra, for instance, or Zirayb, than with the contemporary music genres of the Indian uh, subcontinent. That said, uh, main hopes and goals of Kawali uh, practitioners have changed little over the course of centuries, as Sufis uh, still continue to rely on music to for example, obtain divine knowledge, inspiration, and to ascend through the step levels of spiritual elevation. Arabi personally did not support these practices simply because he deemed them inefficient. He believed uh, all these practices based on singing and dancing and music are based on false assumption that music is something external to the world of nature and that such being external to the world of nature can uplift spiritual seekers beyond the world of nature, beyond the visible world. This is not the case, however, Ibn Arabi claimed. And um, these singing and dancing Sufis uh, have uh, merely mixed up uh, uh, divine and natural Samad. Ibn Arabi said that few things are as cruel as crushing the hopes of these uh, singing and dancing spiritual seekers. And he was aware uh, that his teachings, that his stand on the matter is controversial. And he was well aware how difficult discussions with these uh, singing and dancing people may be. So in his works, he advised the people to read to these dancing Sufis uh, from the Quran in order to attempt to convince them that any knowledge they think they might have gained from their um, Kawali sessions is something that they have previously read in the Quran, something they have heard and known already. This is what Ibn Arabi wrote in particular. One could say to such a person, my brother, this is the same meaning you claimed to have moved to you yesterday during Sama, when the singer brought it out by the means of his beautiful poetry and singing. Whatever meaning came to you yesterday when you were in trance, that meaning is already present in what I just quoted to you from the words of the true, which is higher and truer than music. 
I did not see you yesterday trembling with appreciation and understanding when you were touched by Satan. Natural Sama veiled you from the eye of understanding. All you achieved by the means of your Sama is to become unaware of yourself. How can one who cannot differentiate between his understanding and his movement hope for any sort of success? In other words, not just the, 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 the natural Sama cannot help us reach advanced spiritual knowledge, but it can also prevent us uh, from uh, reaching the knowledge that we are aspiring uh, to reach. Another important indicator that a human being is uh, experiencing natural Sama rather than divine Sama are the circular body movements of uh, dancing Sufis. Uh, this uh, was attributed to the influence of the heavenly spheres by Ibn Arabi. And uh, this is what he wrote in particular. He said, pay attention to the person claiming to have gained spiritual knowledge by the means of Sama as they sit in these sessions. As the singer plays these tunes, inciting movements as one's nature accepts these tunes and they begin flowing through the animal soul, inciting the skeletons to move in circular form based on the principles of the orbiting spheres. These circular movements indicate that one has experienced a natural Sama. This is due to the fact that what is subtle in humans has nothing to do with the orbiting spheres. The subtleness in humans is rather associated with the spirit in the divine breath, not with space. The spirit makes neither circular nor any other movements in the body, since it transcends the orbiting spheres. This is rather what the animal soul does, since the animal soul falls under the scope of influence of the heavenly spheres. One mustn't be ignorant of the properties of the soul and spirit, and of that what is causing them to move. An attender of Sama sessions is incited to move, seized by one state of the mind or another. They start whirling or jumping without circling. They perish and lose their senses of themselves. One should say to such human, what made you move is nothing but a fine tune. The understanding you reached was in accordance with the hierarchy of the spheres, since nature has dominion over the animal soul. Hence, there is no difference between you and a camel with regard to the effect the music had on you. The effect on music of music on human beings was summarized by Ibn Arabi as making them dance in circles, lose their senses, experience strong emotions, and most importantly, realize that their prayers were properly executed, at least with regard to the music of the spheres. Divine Sama that dancing Sufis typically are aspiring to reach for spiritual Sama never rely to find tunes and music which are the sole exclusive properties of the natural Sama. Even Arabi, unlike for instance, the Brethren of Purity, did not advise his readers to rely on the music of the spheres or music to, for example, cure illnesses, or um, help uh, human beings overcome depression, melancholy, and spleen. This is not to say that he was opposed uh, to music or uh, to the pleasures of the animal souls, such as uh, enjoying food, drink, uh, carnal pleasures, or the beauties of the nature. For uh, he was well aware that uh, the prophet Muhammad, for example, was said to have enjoy enjoyed the taste of honey and pumpkins. And uh, not just that he once allowed a woman to play tambourine for him, he also professed his love for women and uh, perfumes. Ibn Arabi also famously uh, composed uh, Zakshal poetry himself. What um, he is me was meaning to say 
is that credit should only be given when the credit is due. As we have seen on the previous slide, the music of the spheres impacts the human body uh, by the means of their animal soul. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there are no surviving paragraphs in any of uh, Ibn Arabi's works uh, explaining how it impacts the world of nature, conditionally speaking, inanimate objects, or how does it make mountains crumble to dust. Uh, however, what we do know is that it impacts human beings through animal soul, which each human possesses. There's nothing uh, inherently wrong with uh, animal soul and uh, its pleasures. It's just that um, Ibn Arabi did not believe that music of the spheres can reach us to advanced spiritual knowledge. It can, however, Ma makes us realize that our prayers are properly executed, which was deemed to be its main purpose in Aquarian Sufism. Thank you for attending my lecture. Any questions, comments uh, will be the most welcome, and I will give my best to uh, answer them during the questions and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dunya. Uh, I'm not sure whether I will ever hear the music of the spheres, but I'm already blessed to have heard this presentation. It was, as, as promised, I think we, it, was, it was great fun and it was also, also very, very insightful and interesting. Before we st turn to the questions, and I can see already a technical question in the, in the chat, uh, a very <laughs> important technical question. I put here, as always, the the next uh, much list we will have, which will be the last one of the spring term uh, by by Hayrettin Yücesoy on political abbasid uh, thought. And now I'm going to switch off the recording and and the question and discussion can start. Yeah, I uh, see already one question in the 